if the firm doesn't have the discipline of doing a cruel base accounting uh, every month, every quarter, and all that's where these things can get away from you. If you run your business by how much money is in the bank, that's not a sign of progressive management. Episode 114. This is The Business of Architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where each week I speak with a successful architect, designer, or consultant to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Sears. Today, we have the privilege and opportunity to have a, C, a former CFO slash COO, that's uh, Chief Financial Officer, Chief Operations Officer, experienced in building and leading finance and business operation teams in over seven organizations. So uh, this gentleman who we're going to be speaking with today has a, a broad, broad experience working in the business world, especially on the financial aspect of things. He has a business consulting group that he helps uh, focus specifically on uh, the AEC industries. And so it's my pleasure to welcome Hugh Glazer to the show today. Hugh, welcome to Business of Architecture. Thank you and good afternoon. Good afternoon, yeah. So, Hugh, let's talk a little bit about what you do and sort of your background. You started out in the, you know, you are a CPA. Are you currently yes. practicing as a CPA? Well, my, I have a valid license, but my I perceive myself more as a business operations consultant, so I do not pro provide the tra traditional tax and audit services um, that, that CPAs typically do, but I help clients be in better position or in better shape to get their data to their outside CPA. So I work very much hand in hand. Excellent. And, you know, the reason why I invited you to be on the show, Hugh, is because I saw in your LinkedIn profile here, it says you're a business coach, a problem solver for C CEOs and CFOs, and specifically helping out small businesses. That, that's correct. And that's um, one of the things I enjoy doing. It's really helping uh, people do a better job of running their businesses. I've always said that people, uh, you know, start companies, particularly professionals like architects or engineers, not because they want to run the business. It's because they're excited about practicing their art or their craft. And sometimes often the price of success is, hey, all of a sudden you've got half a dozen, dozen, several dozen employees, and, and now you're not just one, um, you know, practitioner. You now have an organization that needs, your cre you know, the wheel has to get bigger and have more cogs. And, I'm, and that's what my expertise is, is helping people design and, and put in place an operation that's complementary to the professional practice, provides the appropriate business controls, and, and one up without getting in the way of the creativity. Um, so the people can stay focused on doing the work, serving their clients, but at the same time have an efficient, op you know, in running operation for themselves. So what does that look like generally when you come in and start working with your clients to put in this uh, this organization, as you call it? Well, very, very often it, it, it's it to the folks in place. It sometimes is painful <laughs> um, because they're going from no structure and two, three, four people. And now all of a sudden you have to have discipline. That's the thing that I find that makes the difference between successful practices and those that are always struggling. You have to have discipline. And the discipline comes from setting up a process, making sure that all the principles, superstars and rainmakers alike, all follow you know the the forum practices for establishing projects establishing contracts even simple things like timesheets and expense reports are all part of that routine that when we manage the day-to-day -day transactions the big picture things are easier to manage and have fall in place and what are the what are some of the common mistakes that you see small businesses making um, they don't think about the, the things I, I was just sort of uh, touching on and sit down ahead of time and um, say, okay, how do we get organized? It, it's sort of the, the organization becomes in the beginning almost a firefighting exercise, um, but very often um, picking the right accounting software, staying on software that's not strong enough for too long. 
Um, and, and just not, again, working on the discipline of how are we going to um, lay a foundation so that as we grow and as strategic opportunities come up, we're positioned to take advantage of them, not having this scramble of we had this project or this contract that now is 50% bigger than anything else we've ever done before and not being equipped to manage it well. So if you come in as an advisor into one of these companies who kind of, I, I would imagine that they, they engage you because they start to feel some pain. They start to feel, man, we really need some organization here. We need to get someone in here who can help us organize this. Oh, very much so. Uh, very, very often there, there's a catalyst type of event. We ran out of cash. The bank says our financial statements are late or the financial statements are inaccurate and, and there's a lot of mistakes. Um, partners failing, gee, we're doing all this work. It doesn't seem like we're making as much money as I thought we should make, or we're not making as much money as we used to make. Um, th those are all symptomatics of situations that I often get introduced to firms. And so what, what things could cause a firm to look at their financials and say, hey, wait a second, I'm not making as mon much money as I used to make. What are some common causes of that? Well, one, one, one level, it might be not understanding the difference between cash and accrual accounting. Most firms report um, for tax basis on a cash basis, which is basically the money that came in and the money that went out. But due to the timing, particularly of complex work like architects and engineers or in the, you know, the AEC field, as, you, as we call it, put in, they're, they're events to take place over time. And accrual basis accounting is really the only true way of um, being able to properly judge how a firm is performing. And it's, if you're not, and again, it comes back to discipline. If the firm doesn't have the discipline of doing accrual base accounting uh, every month, every quarter, and all that's where these things can get away from you. If you run your business by how much money is in the bank, that's not a sign of progressive management. So give us, a, can you give us a accrual accounting 101 for us um, architects who are not, we're not accountants? Sure. So um, let, let's say, um, you know, it's a difference between this month you collected, let's say $100,000 on work that you performed in prior months. But our we're billing and WIP this month, we build out three hundred thousand. So on an accrual basis, the revenue for the month is three hundred thousand. On the cash basis, it's a hundred. Same thing as let's say we paid fifty thousand dollars to consultants or subcontractors for work they did in prior months. But along with that three hundred thousand of billing, We've got another. We've got 150,000 of invoices that are going to come in from consultants and subcontractors related to the work that got generated. But we won't pay them using the paid when paid concept. We won't pay them until the future months when our clients pay us. So in that case, your consulting expense on the accrual basis is 150,000, and on the cash basis. It would be, I think, 50 was the number I used in the example. So are, are you telling me that using accrual basis accounting gives a, a better view of cash flow in a business? It's better. It's a better view of income and expense and net profit, which helps forecast future cash flow. Um, but it is not, that's, that's part of what, what the uh, sort of intellectual divide is, is understanding that cash flow is a different path than pr net profit. I mean, there's times where they can be the same, but generally, unless you, everything all takes place within the same 30-day accounting month, they're very rarely the same. And what happens very often in situations, you have payroll, you have overhead, you have all your pretty much non-labor direct project costs that you're paying pretty close to the month that they happen, but the revenue from that month doesn't show up until later. So you, th this is where companies often get ca have cash problems because the expenses are going out before the income or the cash from the income that was involved with generating the money to pay those expenses arrive. So there's a timing 
the timing difference. And, and very often when firms, new firms start, they don't think about that original initial working capital. You know, we're going to have to pay our employees. We're going to have to pay our rents, but we may not see the money from our clients from our first project billing for 60, 90, hopefully not 120 days, but that's um, the, that's the planning and sort of the difference between the two. I mean, they need to kind of coexist in parallel and with the right practices and software, that's a very easy thing to do. But when they're not, when they're completely divorced or, or not paying attention to the accrual basis, that's where these things kind of jump up and surprise you. So, Am I hearing you correctly to say that, in summary, that they should be looking at both the, the cash accounting basis and the accrual accounting? Yes. And, and the way I would, I would summarize it is that if during the year, you're keeping focused on the accrual basis and you're managing your cash flow. I always recommend that everybody maintain a rolling 13-week cash flow. Then the, the Doing formal accounting on the cash basis is not really something you have to worry about until the end of the year. It then becomes a pro forma transaction that the accounting, the person doing the tax return can do just by taking the accrual basis information and bringing it back to cash. Okay. And when you say a rolling 13 week, could you tell me what that looks like? It's a, a spreadsheet. I would recommend Excel and not paper. Um, and you have across the top, or maybe it would be this way, depending on reverse lighting, you know, a, a column for every week. And down the left, um, you, maybe you start at the top, it's cash receipts. These are based on the invoicing that's outstanding and how these clients pay, what month or what week we expect the cash to come in. And then underneath it, you've got lines for rent, payroll, consultants, and when over the next 13 weeks you would plan to be paying those expenses out. So the bottom half kind of gives you your cash need, and it's very a similar, uh, or it's actually what I would call cash break even. So you know how much cash has to come in every week or every month in order to pay your normal or, or expected expenses. So it's very, you know, it's the, the width part of it is pretty straightforward, you know, one week one through 13 and you have the date and then down the side you have your categories. It can be very simple or it can be very, very detailed depending on the needs and the sophistication of the firm. Okay. And you said down on the, on the lower half would be the expenses that the firm ex expects to accrue during those particular weeks or the, I guess the, the expenses they expect to pay? Yes, the expenses they expect to pay. And then along the top, you would say, was that the, I didn't catch that, was that the income? Right. The top section could be the income, you know, cash from uh, invoices built to clients 60 days ago, 90 days ago, 30 days ago. And you, because you, because clients generally have a patent and you can forecast out what, how many weeks after the date of the invoice that you're going to get paid. Yep. And, and so that we'll, way down, I'm sorry. Oh, it'll be a cash you expect to be paid. Yes. Okay. And that worksheet takes the place of worrying about the account accounting on the cash basis method because it's really only a tax tool. And then once you have the firm doing all its accounting on the accrual basis, you're really more concerned about cash flow on a week to week, month to month basis, and not necessarily your cash basis income or loss. Usually what happens in most firms that are assuming everybody's on the calendar year, somewhere around Thanksgiving, the inside accounting team and the outside accounting firm would start taking a look at what the cash basis profit for the year was as a tax planning tool. Yep. So they, they would look back, yeah, they would look back at the cash accounting and then sort of forecast, you know, what kind of taxes are we going to be paying? Right. What's going to look like by the time December 31st rolls around. Yep. So how does this, so I think we started down this this path, first of all, talking about what you see when you first come into a business and sort of the, one of the things you start looking at is the accrual basis accounting. So you run some of those numbers. And then what are some of the other changes that you generally recommend when working with a business to help them, you know, uh, boost their profits? I think utilization. Who's working on utilization and, and net yields? You know, you have two phenomena. While well, on one hand, we want everybody to be as close to 100% direct as possible, 
We also want to know that after the fact that we're billing and collecting all of the time that's charged as direct time. So you can have very good utilization, but if at the end of the, the month or when the project's over, you only build 75% of the direct utilization, you, then you didn't make as much as you thought you would. So I think that's very important that um, when projects of significance are put together, that there's, that there's a projection of profit, you know, if a firm, depending on what the firm's uh, profit multiple is, that, you know, when every once in a while you take a project that's not at your target multiple, uh, multiple and there's a variety of reasons, you know, why you would do that, but that every project of substance, you start out and saying, our expectation is we should yield this net profit or contribution margin on the project. And you got you to gotta monitor that. A monitor, you know, a percentage of completion that that projects at at certain points of time, maybe it's 50 percent, 75 percent, that someone in management is sitting down and saying, is the are the cost on this project tracking the way we estimated? And that and that's particularly important on anything that's not time and materials. If it's fixed, you know, it's the fixed fee uh, projects that can be the death of you if you're not managing the cost. And, um, you know, a couple that are running below your target break even is, is okay, but you can't be doing the majority of them or at the end of the year or eventually it's going to have cash flow and net profit ramifications. Yep. So what would cause a firm not to uh, bill out their total utilization? When you say you just see sometimes, you know, they're just billing out 75% uh, is just... Well, you, you spent more time on it than the budget. People weren't given the right direction. Um, it, the, the wrong level of staff was used on it. Either it's people that were too expensive or people that were less experienced and inefficient. Um, another big thing that happens a lot of times is it's actually work scope creep that should have been additional services, but the staff and the team aren't trained properly to mark the time and cost related to scope creep or additional services, or even sometimes when they do, nobody raises their hand at, with the client at the appropriate time and says, hey, Mr. or Ms. Client, we've got a problem here. You've now asked us to go off in an area that's beyond the scope and the fees of the project. And sometimes it never gets noticed until the project's over and closed and you're looking at the numbers. Other times it comes up but it's so late in the project, by the time you mention it to the client, the client's now in an embarrassing point because from their budget, they have no way to go and make the money available. So it, it comes back to, you know, another thing besides discipline is communication. A lot of these problems come from if you don't have the discipline to know, to understand and mark when you're in this scope creep or additional services area and nobody is trained to raise their hand at the appropriate time of, how do we handle this when we're in the situation? You know, everybody wants to serve the client, move the project forward, not create friction. But at the same time, we're providing services. We want to be paid our value for those services. And the best time to do that is at the time the event starts, not when it's over. How would you say that uh, firms can recognize when scope creep is happening? Everybody on the team or certainly at the senior level of the project manager or the direct supervisors needs to understand how the project is written. They need to understand the scope of the fees. Everybody should see the proposal. Um, there has to be some oversight when there's meetings with clients, a uh, project review meeting to someone that can step back and say, hey, wait a minute, this is great, but this conversation is now in a new area beyond the proposal. If everybody has their head down on the treadmill, just trying to get the, you know, the work out, the drawings and the documents and whatnot, it's very easy to get lost because everybody's excited about doing the work. Um, but it's that business piece that has to have the discipline and the communication. I think a very good idea is um, at certain points in time at the beginning and throughout the project that someone perhaps from the business side of the firm should have contacts with the client. 
and the people, the supervisory folks on the project with the client. So there's the two-way conversation with the client and the firm is not just between the professionals delivering the work. And then when scope creep is recognized that a firm realizes, hey, wait a second, we're, you know, this, this isn't under our original agreement. How, what's the best way to approach that conversation with the client? You know, you, you call up and you say, hey, you know, I just wanted to check in with you. I was, you know, we, in these recent conversations, I see this happening and our interpretation of the scope of the project or our contract does not cover that. We need to talk about what do you want us to what do you want us to do? Nice. And so, because, so and put it back to the client. Yeah. And the and then you you know and then it's continue stop or can we take it from something else you know part of the part of the work that's coming ahead? You know there, there's lots of so there's many solutions before you're in the hole too deep, so to speak. Once it's over and done, then we're just trying to bail water out of the boat. And, and minimize, you know, get as much recovery as we can, not damage the relationship with the client. Um, so it's all about communi- timely communication at the, at the most senior level where as, as appropriate. And then project controls are obviously very important to be able to realize when scope creep is starting to happen. Right. Yes, and I, and I think that's an important part of, of the firms that I see that do this well. They have project review meetings at, at a minimum biweekly. Sometimes if it's a large enough project, um, it could be done weekly. And where the project manager needs to report in the percentage of complete. Now, that's the other thing here is we have so many tracks of, um, of information about percentage of completion. There's the percentage of completion of how the work, you know, let's call it out in the field, is actually progressing. That, and I'll use a very simplistic answer. I mean, example: if we have a four-story building and we've completed three floors, we're seventy-five percent done. However, we may not have billed the client for seventy-five percent yet, and we may not have paid out the costs that go with that seventy-five percent. So it's, it's always important to know, when I use the three-floor example, let's call that the in-the-field percentage, that the PMs are on top of where the actual work is so that in partnership with the business and accounting team, they can look at how does that track to where we are in the billing? How does that track against the cost budget? And so if, if you're at 75% of the work, and you spent 95% of the cost budget, that's forecasting not a good outcome. Assuming even, you know, even uh, flatlining uh, that the costs are incurred evenly. So you have to always be looking at the three tracks of where's the work, where's the billing, where's the cost, and on the latter two, how does that line up with our project budget? And the best way to do that, again, it's communication. There has to be some review while the project is going on um, and uh, not left till, hey, we're down to the last bill. We're billing and closing to 100%. How did we do? Good. Well, hopefully that's been a good reminder for our listeners. Hugh, what are some other mistakes that you see small businesses making? Um, I think it's addressing problems. If you have people um, on the team, both on the professional side as well as the admin and operations side that aren't, you know, delivering or performing at the level they should, you know, you have to, you, you want to communicate, you want to express, give people goals and targets, but then you have to have feedback. And if a change is a, needs to be made, not let it linger because generally the good people on a team know that the people that aren't who the people are that aren't performing and it's both a morale distraction as well as get, makes the stronger people sh- um, shoulder more of the burden than is fair to them on the professional side if you have people that have business development targets everybody should know that and there should be some periodic review um, of, hey, we brought you in here. The expectation was you were going to bring in X million dollars of revenue. We've had this 12, 18-month window. The numbers aren't coming in. We need to have a plan to correct this 
well, we need to take some different action. It, it's, it's not addressing those kind of things, um, whether it's hiring a critical new hire on the professional side or doing an acquisition. Um, very often those targets are not, and expectations are not laid out clearly. And then nobody comes back and measures. And then you wake up 18, 24 months. Hey, we spent all this money on salaries for these people. And you know what? The profit is lower than it was when we started. <laughs> you know, and the same thing can happen on the accounting and business operation team. People get overwhelmed. The practice changes. Different skill set is needed. And again, all people need to be coached and, and given the skills to help them step up to the occasion. But, if you, but you have to have measurement and feedback um, and have a window where, hey, you know, we all agreed this is what we, how, what we were going to do to address things. We agreed that we're going to come back and revisit it in 60, 90, 120 days. And then you have like a report card. Um, and um, it's that lingering to take action where someone will say, oh, yeah, we, we've got to deal with that problem. And six months, nine months, ten months later, the problem is still there, but no action has taken place. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.